Castlevania Nocturne. I'm going to be reviewing this by breaking it down into several sections. We're first going to rate it as an adaptation of Castlevania, and then we're going to rate the writing, the characters, the cinematography and animation, the music, the choreography, the character design, my favorite scenes, spoilers of course, and a final score. So let's talk about Castlevania Nocturne as an adaptation. I've been following Samuel Dietz on Twitter and it's been super interesting to see uh, sort of the genesis of this show. I think it is a fantastic adaptation of Castlevania. Any fan will love it and not just for the reason that we are starved as Castlevania fans. There's tons of Castlevania-isms in this show that really bring it to life, bring a lot of character to it. There's a spirit to the game that is very much captured here. Uh, so as an adaptation from a game that is not really known for its, you know, it's not like Final Fantasy, it doesn't have like, you know, 10 hours of cutscenes. The most cutscenes that ever existed in Castlevania are like Curse of Darkness, Lament of Innocence, not fan favorites. I love those games, they're actually some of my favorites, but they're not lauded as the fan favorites. You usually talk about Symphony of the Night, um, and even some of the more retro ones. To see it in that fashion, kind of brought to life with such rich characters, such depth, uh, such exploration, which was a staple of the original Castlevania series on Netflix, it was really special, and I'm glad they retained that. Um, they'll just have these scenes where there's long conversations, and it's odd because that has become, I think, one of the favorite things of fans of the first seasons of Castlevania, the first series of Castlevania, they'll just have like Isaac talking to this pirate guy for like 10 minutes, and it's the, it's, it'll be like the highlight of the episode incredible conversations and a lot of the time not so conventional narrative storytelling and they brought that back for this so it's it's not so much is it a perfect adaptation of castlevania it is taking one medium that is not very story heavy and making it into a medium that is and i think the transition was done very very nicely so this is it's a strange adaptation it's not so simple as say taking a book to screen uh or something like that like you know we think of lord of the rings it's not really like that at all. They they captured it by utilizing the medium of film and animation to its fullest and using the cinematic tools to their advantage. So that's about the adaptation. Let's talk about the writing. Uh, I think the writing is very well done. Uh, it's very strong and they're very good at kind of giving us narrative ties to all the characters and giving all the characters something to be motivated about in the show. Uh, for example, we have Annette and Maria, who are not the main characters of the show, right? We have, uh, we have Richter, who's the main character. And yet, Annette and Maria both have, like, really interesting stuff that they care about throughout the whole season, and stuff they have extreme motivations to, to make right, and, like, sort of their own mini-quests, even though they're all on the same quest. So I thought that was very, very well done. Um, the characters all felt real because of those written in motivations and these, these are motivations that are created for the series um annette is one of the standouts as in in the games she was not a character with a ton of depth like i said even richter in the games is not a character with a ton of depth um you know his gameplay is quite deep right but they don't have the time so in this it was awesome to see even annette maria and a lot of the other characters have these great backstories uh, another standout is Olrox. Oh man, amazing. We're going to talk about the characters a little bit later, but just fantastically done. And as far as the writing, they actually injected a lot of historical context um, into this situation. Uh, again, there's a lot of Castlevania-isms, but in this case with the writing, they decided not to make it just always Dracula. Let's fight Dracula again. Let's fight him again. His castle's back. Let's fight him again. Um, though I think he will come back eventually. Um, if we know what happens in the Castlevania timeline, I think there'll be a great time to bring him back. But I'm really impressed with what they did because they're finding new awesome people for the, our heroes to fight. And it doesn't always have to be Dracula. So they, they nailed that right on the head as far as the writing kind of injecting this Rondo of Blood story. Um, adapting this game into a completely different situation right uh, to kind of use what has already been established in the castlevania timeline and what happened to dracula before they can't just have him like pop back up and like i'm evil and i don't like it doesn't make sense it doesn't work with his character that they've established so i like how the writing is consistent and there's a lot of great nods to the the other series to the other castlevania series so i thought it was great the character work is there and they still had that identity that they'd established of the characters having these deep monologues with each other and just kind of these intimate scenes um you know, mixed up with insane battles and fight scenes. So I think that was uh, sort of a highlight of the writing, but the scenes themselves 
run very well. The dialogue is great. And of course, that is that is aided by the performance. The performances were fantastic. And we'll talk more about that with the characters and individuals that stood out to me. But the performances and the writing worked very well together, much like the older seasons in that a lot of the writing is very uh, it's very rooted in real dialogue. This kind of this gritty realness to it and super tangible. Um, performances that you can latch onto, that you can respond to, and that feel very real. Um, even the villains have motivations and they have uh, interesting things that they're up to and they're not just kind of like set pieces, boss fights. Um, like I said, again, in the games, this is why we love the games, there's awesome bosses to fight, um, but in this they have a little bit more depth and I'll get into that with the characters, um, which is next, so characters. Oh, there's so many good characters in this. Uh, Drolta is one of the standouts. Uh, for example, we pulled the cast here. Yeah, Drolta by Aralika Johnson. Fantastic, fantastic character. I think probably my favorite character this season along with Olrox. Um, just such a fun character, Drolta. And it's interesting because they were talking about the character design for Drolta uh, and they eventually showed like a bunch of options for the character design. And the character designer said, oh, which one do you want? And I think it was Samuel Dietz said, uh, all of them, I want all of them. So in every scene, Drolta has like an awesome different outfit on and uh, it was just it became almost like kind of a not an inside joke but just like a, one of those cool easter eggs about the show it's like oh what's what's gonna be her next appearance so it was super fun and it added to uh, it added to the joy there of course Olrox oh my goodness by Zane McLaren Aztec vampire right right off the bat something new and fresh and invigorating um, as far as the writing goes, like what a cool idea. Uh, he's, a, he's an Aztec vampire that can turn into like a snake dragon, like Quetzalcoatl looking thing. It's so cool. And uh, again, just something we've not seen. We've seen the Victorian vampires a million times and we love them, but why not have both, right? Why not have something we're familiar with and then something that's super new and fresh and cool and have these characters interact, right? Like wouldn't there be vampires all over the world if there's this been uh, this established society of vampires uh, in this in this timeline in the series so very very clever Olrox is a standout uh he's just fantastic and Zane really nails the scenes uh just such a such a great example of kind of using that I've I'm immortal I've been a lot I've been around for hundreds of years just this almost bored way of delivering the lines almost just super calm I don't have to really worry about anything I've been around a long time and it was great very very well done uh, Annette, I mentioned Annette earlier by uh, Tuso Mbedu. Annette is fantastic, really, really cool character. They took Annette in the game, very, very two-dimensional character. I mean, literally in this case, but <laughs> also she's great in the show. They injected uh, humanity into her and to have that lore uh, of Caribbean and African deities and magic and everything. It was just really, really unique. Um, again, in Castlevania, which is typically known for being gothic, Victorian, um, in some cases Italian uh, set pieces and characters and stuff, but in this case we got a whole other world uh, injected into it because they decided to place these characters uh, from the Caribbean. So it was really, really good. Uh, and of course the other character from the Caribbean was Edouard by Sidney James Harcourt. Very, very good performance as well, and I'm not sure if it was uh, the actor who sang the opera that was Sydney singing. If it was, fantastic job. Of course, Edward as Richter Belmont, I thought he was a really cool performance. And I thought it was a really great character. Um, they really brought Richter to life. And um, it was awesome to kind of inject him with this. He does have that haughtiness and that arrogance that we know Richter from, from the games, right? But he has this sort of fear, panic complex that develops from, it's literally the first scene of the show. Something happens to him, it's very traumatic when he's a little boy. And then we have nine years later. Um, how is Richter going to get through this? And it was awesome. It was spectacular to see how they handled, you know, a very human way of going about that. You can be like a very strong, brave, arrogant person. But if you have something that's like super traumatic for you, you can still just slip into this almost like paralysis. And it was really cool to see that um, take place. And he just has a lot of anger because of what happened to him. But he still has this like really nice heart of gold that comes out, but you can tell, kind of like his ancestor Trevor, he uh, he tries to be cool all the time and kind of detach from everything. Uh, Franca Potente as Elizabeth Bathory. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the historical context here. This was such a cool character. 
that chose to be the villain for the season. If you don't know, there's actually some historical context for Elizabeth Bathory. And uh, she was a Hungarian noblewoman, an alleged serial killer from the family of Bathory who owned land in the Kingdom of Hungary, uh, now Slovakia. So it's just like, what a cool thing. They put this almost like this folklore level villain that they added into the show, which was great. Now stories about Bathory, uh, oh, Bathory and four of her servants were accused of torturing and killing hundreds of girls and women between 1590 and 1610. Her servants were put on trial and convicted, whereas Bathory was imprisoned within the castle Kizete. Crazy, right? It's crazy. And then stories about Bathory quickly became part of national folklore, legends describing her vampiric tendencies. Some insist she inspired Bram Stoker's Dracula, too. So I did not know it was that deep uh, of this person in history. And some people attributed her as the blood countess in history and everything. It's, it's super fascinating. And the backstory for all these characters is, is brought out, um, I would say particularly for Annette and Edouard, uh, is, is really explored in an interesting way. In fact, they take a whole episode to explore these characters' backstories. Uh, and there's some really good scenes where you get intimate moments like with Richter, uh, Maria. Oh, Maria is a standout too. Yeah, Pixie Davies plays Maria. And of course, um, what is her name? Nastasia Kinski plays Tara, who is Maria's mother. Really standout performance there as well. But there, there's this sort of family aspect to what they have with Richter. And there's a couple of really intimate scenes where they just talk and, and it's fantastic. And they take the time to have those in this crazy adventure. Cinematography and animation. Uh, fantastically done. Again, I've been uh, following Samuel Dietz on Twitter and kind of seeing a lot of the work that went into it and the passion. Um, the cinematography is, I would say, very ambitious. And uh, there's a lot of movement within 3D space for the cinematography and animation, particularly in the fight scenes. Very, very difficult stuff to do, guys. Um, and that's that's the word I would use with the whole thing is ambitious cinematography. There's a few shots with the lighting, very, very deep ways and very, um, very ambitious lighting for, for animation. Like, you know, tons of different facets to the light reflecting off of surfaces, bouncing off the face, like at a sunset and everything. A lot of colors to the light as well. A lot of refractions in the eyes. Um, was a standout for me uh, but there are also like i said they will punch in um, with a nice portrait lens for uh for a lot of the moments with the characters as well and it uh it, it works quite well music is fantastic um this is much more castlevania feeling music than the previous seasons i had my gripes with the music in the previous seasons not because of its quality it was well done it was great uh trevor morris did really good i think it was more trying to capture the essence of castlevania um, music, which is this kind of, at times, like jazz metal synthesis with Baroque, you know, skeleton to the entire thing. It's a very hard thing to capture. And Michiru Yamane, who did the music um, prominently through all like the most popular games, um, it's really hard to capture that and, and inject that into like like a talking scene. And so I see why they chose to do that for the, for the earlier seasons, kind of have this kind of like ambient sound to a lot of it uh, a little bit more subdued but for this they did go a lot bigger with it they did go a lot bigger and and i thought it was really really more castlevania feeling uh you heard the organs you heard the cellos and kind of like these deep um gothic baroque inspired sounds um it did exist throughout and it was really really good to see it was really really good to see and there's some standout scenes where the music uh they do use some classic music from castlevania i won't spoil what if you want to wait and see but if you've seen the trailer you will see that a specific song is already in here and it was when the song was used it was awesome it was beautifully done it was beautifully done uh very very strong and uh classic castlevania fans will be rejoicing in the scene not just for the music but for other amazing references and just just you know the plotting at, at how wonderful it's done and and how victoriously they they capture that so the music was great as far as the choreography i thought it was amazing like i said there's a couple scenes where richter is just like boxing people <laughs> and it's really well done um and they combine magic into the fight choreography in a way that's super creative um, for example, there's a scene like a lot of the people are magicians and they're able to like imbue magic onto their fists and their arms to use it as 
shields. Maria has amazing abilities right out of the games, which was very faithful. She's able to summon like animals from a different dimension and have them like fight for her. So she's like throwing birds at people, not throwing, she's instructing them to attack people. And she has, um, she has like a tiger that comes out. It's just really, really fun. She has like a massive snapping turtle that she uses as a shield and it just like floats in front of her. Oh, it's so creative. And so what I mean to say, is they were using these awesome abilities. Uh, Annette has this ability to communicate with like her African ancestors and control the earth and like turn the earth into swords and stuff. It's really, really cool. Um, and there's a whole backstory that goes into how she does this and everything. It's not just like, yeah, it looks cool. Here's the power. Very, very well done. And um, she had to train to get this power and stuff. It's, it's quite awesome. But um, they use all these powers in, in kind of very practical ways. So there, there'll be these larger than life moments where she, you know, she's like throwing a, a sand created sword at somebody and then like catching it like a boomerang and slicing through. But, you know, beyond those big moments, there's so much just like hand to hand fighting and you'll see people parrying and and like I said, magic imbued like ice boxing on their hands and stuff. But it, it looks like real fighting. You know, it's, it's very rooted in reality. It's not just like every single move is a crazy thing. Um, as we saw with Trevor in the old series, Richter, of course, uses his whip incredibly proficiently and is able to just decimate people with it is incredibly powerful. But it's implied that for nine years straight, he trained without magic, just <laughs> with like his knives and his whip um, to get stronger and to take revenge. So it's like, yeah, he'd, he'd be really good at that. And it was awesome to see because he has to kind of use that as his crutch uh, in his martial arts. So that was really awesome. Um, you know, not having magic like the other characters do. So I thought that was really, really well done. But yeah, choreography is great. There's a couple scenes near the end that are just spectacular fight choreography and really really awesome set pieces with tons of different enemies fighting and uh and you know creative ways of dispatching them and uh you know using all these powers that i described um but they explored the powers quite quite deeply and quite thoroughly so th i thought that was awesome um next we're going to talk about character design uh we touched on it briefly but just amazing work like i said how would an aztec vampire style himself and, and move about the world and we get that answered with Olrox and Drolta which I think is meant to be more of like a Russian I'm not really sure exactly what her her full origin is but um, awesome awesome Car crazy character design and I love that you know a lot of it is rooted in reality as far as the French side of like the non-vampiric people um, but the vampires have their own society and they have magic and they have immortality and stuff. So it's very understandable. They would have different technology, different fashion. And I love how they lean into that and, and kind of explore that in this. It was very well done. Um, so character design was, was top notch. Um, I am going to talk about a couple of my favorite scenes. Um, minor spoilers, not, nothing too crazy. I won't talk about the ending or anything. Um, but there was a couple scenes where it's just like, wow, this is so well done. And we didn't talk about it earlier, but Lane Glenn, uh, who you may know from Game of Thrones, he plays Just Belmont in this, um, which was, this information has been out there for a while on, on Twitter and everything. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And for me, this really solidified um, what made it such a good Castlevania adaptation and, and written piece was that with the old season, with Trevor and Alucard, knowing all of those guys from the past, seeing... Uh, Just and then his daughter Julia and then Richter like we're, we're seeing from Trevor onward and stuff you know we missed uh, who do we miss in the timeline Castlevania experts helped me out we missed um, uh, Soleil Belmont we missed Christopher Belmont we missed Simon Belmont um, is that it is there one I think there might be like one more in there one more generation I'm forgetting and then there's uh, Just Julia but yeah it's it's awesome so what I mean to say is you're, you're getting to start to visualize the timeline and the legacy of Castlevania and these characters. And it's awesome. It's really, really powerful to, to kind of get that sense of scale. And that I think has always been one of the joys of Castlevania and being a fan and getting into the series is 
you piece together this massive legacy of all these characters and their uh and their parentage and where they came from and you know what powers they inherit and stuff because it's really cool you had trevor and sypha from the old series who had certain powers and then richter has inherited those powers uh he's not just like trevor was so it's, it's really really cool that they um that they were so careful with the details and again in the games it was never the focus to have these like you know really really long conversations between characters and stuff and we get to have a sense uh a little bit more character driven sense of that legacy in, in the series so yeah very very well done but there's a scene uh there's a couple of scenes that i really enjoyed with uh juiced and richter that were just awesome really 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 well done scenes that stood out immensely and uh, there's a lot of scenes where the character Edward is singing opera and uh, it's just awesome. And they'll use it, to, you know, it's called diegetic sound as, a, as I taught in my uh, gaming channel, right? It's called diegetic sound. We can hear the sound in the world of the story and they'll use that. But then of course, add in other instruments, non-diegetic sound and create this really cool piece, um, you know, which then becomes the soundtrack. So it's just super, super smart. Uh, clever way of, of filmmaking and animation and uh, there's a couple scenes like that I won't spoil what's happening that are super powerful and very well done and there's some very um, you know quiet scenes where they're singing as well not just during fight scenes and it's it's very well done um, without spoiling too much like I said sort of the character motivations as they cropped up and, and were revealed for Annette Maria uh, Tara these really stood out to me and there's a couple scenes um, near the end where you get to kind of unearth more of that and it's it's very very compelling i thought uh and like i said my favorite scenes were kind of the more character driven ones like that and it wasn't just like fight scene with unnamed creature whatever it was more like i have to do something for my own personal quest that i'm on and i'm going to explore that now you know so it was really cool it was very very cool um and very well done but yeah, um, final score, I'm going to give it, man, I would say I've got to give it at least a nine, probably closer, closer to a 9.5 if I had to score. I, might, I, you know, I tend to stay away from exact numbers, um, but that's, that's what I'm feeling about it. Um, any negatives that I can think of are more just like, you know, it, it, I just want more. <laughs> so it's not really, it's not really a lot of negatives. Um, like I said, some of the animation is very ambitious and some of the fight scenes are very ambitious 360 rotating cameras and, and and focal length shifting while attacking with a whip and like magical skulls being summoned from another dimension and like maria's animals flying at different angles as the cameras rotate it's like incredibly difficult to animate um but yeah my final thoughts is it's fantastic check it out if you're a fan or not of castlevania absolutely worth a watch um fantastic work animation uh like i keep saying the word ambitious but it's it's great and it's different and it's it's a fantasy but you know it feels like it could take place in a fantasy world but it's our world but there's there's vampires that we've never seen from different cultures there's magic we've never seen from different cultures mixed into stuff that is already kind of rooted in the castlevania legacy and it all comes together very well and it works as a, a perfect springboard for next season um, I don't know how long we'll have to wait for next season, but uh, I really hope it's uh, it's already cooking because this was a strong, strong first season. And I won't spoil the last scene, but it is awesome. And it's interesting because it's very rare to pull off a cliffhanger so well because it's a balance. Like if you go too cliffhanger -y, it's like, oh God, I feel like I got no payoff. Now I just have to be like, uh, while they think up the story, it's too much of a cliffhanger. But they nailed this perfect balance of like, Oh no, it's gonna be a cliffhanger, but it's so awesome that you're like, I don't even care. This is amazing. <laughs> like, I'm so excited for next season. And it's hard to do that from a writing perspective and a visual and audio perspective. And they nailed it. So, uh, shout out to the creators. Like I said, I follow Sam Dietz on, on Twitter and really enjoy his work. And uh, overall, it's just awesome. So, if you enjoyed our time together, make sure to subscribe if you're on YouTube. Also, um, yeah, make sure to follow over here on Twitch. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for watching. Shout out to the creators and the cast. Great work. <laughs>